Now that book was hand painted. Painting is rising as one of the great crafts for sure. Painters still in the Renaissance aren't quite, you know, celebrity level. We'll talk about Leonardo and Michelangelo and Raphael soon, but they're nowhere near the kind of star power that we have, especially in the 20th century and onward when it comes to artists, painters, and that type of life. In Flanders, as well as Burgundy, painters would have been organized into guilds. Often those guilds would be named after St. Luke, who is the patron saint of painters. So it, again, would not be blasphemy for Roger van der Weyden to paint himself a self-portrait in the guise of St. Luke. He's in its essence embodying his patron saint as that uh, figure draws the Virgin. He's drawing also very particularly in silver point, sketching her out, experiencing her quite literally. He's in the same space with her. So again, not blasphemy. It's not a joke. It wouldn't be seen as incorrect. The idea of these paintings where you have a real life person or an aspect, a patron saint of that real life person in the same room as a spiritual figure like Mary and the Christ child. It's an aspect of devotion. It sets aside these paintings as more than just pictures, more than just illustrations. These are guides for prayer. These are objects of devotion meant to direct the mind and the spirit in the act of worship. For us, formally, Van der Weyden is using a combination of tempera paint and oil. Tempera is the tried and true traditional paint that's been used for centuries on uh, things like the parchment pages of a book of hours, as well as a wooden panel here. Oil paint, remember, that is where the Flemish painters really shine, literally. Oil paint lets Roger van der Weyden add that glow in the gold brocade over the Virgin Mary. It adds the shimmering to her blue and gold robes. It adds the shimmer to uh, Luke's red robes. On top of this, you know, that is kind of the, the wonderful surface texture that the Northern artists become known for, is also this lovely perspective not just linear, as we can see uh, the lines of the tiles on the floor, the lines of Mary's throne uh, recede into the background along the horizon line. You can draw them even further to the vanishing point that creates, that uh, meets at the very center of the panel. But, let me erase those so we can also see. He's also using a bit of atmospheric perspective where we can see the colors are not quite so bold, not quite so shimmery, fading into the distance. So color and texture, as well as scale, are used to get a sense of what is close and what is far. Meaning not only is St. Luke kneeling before the Virgin, but we as the viewer have come into contact as well. So van der Weyden, in his kind of combination tempera and oil paint leads us to uh, the two greats, Campen and Van Eyck. All of these uh, painters painting right around the same time in the early decades of 15th century would have known each other, in some cases trained each other, and were rivals against each other. But one note about perspective, it's not a rule in such that to be a painter, you must use it. Because look at the perspective of Campen's work on the right-hand side. If we were to place ourselves in the room, the way we can place ourselves on the edge of the room with St. Luke and the Virgin, do we feel like we're standing on the floor? Or do we kind of feel like we're kind of floating up a little bit? And look at the very distant uh, wall. Does it look correct? 
or does it look a little skewed? A little too far away? Look at this massively long bench here. Look at the table that is tipped up so that we can see, very importantly, candle, flower, and book. An artist like Campin, he's not wrong, remember. He's making these choices to fit the panel and to make sure that we see particular objects. Basically, every single object in that room has religious symbolism. It has a role to play. And perhaps most importantly, this one. Did you even notice it at first? So we have, again, two sides, Angel Gabriel and Mary. So we have domestic interior side, a young woman doing her duty, piously reading at prayer. The Ga Angel Gabriel comes in from the outside world, from heaven, from above, hence the windows up here. Look who else is coming. That is essentially the Holy Spirit coming to enter Mary. That is, see the cross? That is Jesus. That is a manifestation of the child that will be. Again, not meant to be humorous, not meant to be a joke. It's the idea of this is the Annunciation. Gabriel is announcing that what will happen and in a way, it is about to be conceived, literally. It is about to happen as we see the little man, the homunculus, uh, gliding in on the shimmery gold rays. So there's much, much more that we can get into. I just wanna focus on the relationship now between the center of the altarpiece and the two side panels. This is an Annunciation triptych, meaning three parts center and left and right. The left and right have donor portraits and another figure that maybe you might be aware of if you know the Christmas story, Joseph, husband of Mary. On the left, the donor portraits here help us to kind of puzzle out the choices of center and right panel. So we can kind of think of it as left to right, we have the weird world, Earth, 15th century. We have the world of the New Testament, the Annunciation. And then we have, again, kind of an interpretation of the biblical world. So the centerpiece is definitely from the Bible, it's from scripture. The right-hand side is more an interpretation of the Bible. The key are the names of the donors, two family names. So we have a husband and wife, Engelbrecht and Scrinmaker. Engelbrecht translates to angel bringer. There's the angel brought. Scrinmaker, cabinet maker, carpenter, Joseph's line of work. And there he is in his workshop. Still with me? So we have from left to right, the real world or the earthly realm where we can see our donors, our real life people kneeling before an open door as if they are following Gabriel in. And that line of sight, that motion continues all the way to the right. So Joseph is not an afterthought. Joseph is kind of the main event in a way because he's where we end. What is Joseph making? That's where you kind of have to take my word for it in the book. He's building a mouse trap. Not a mouse trap that you and I maybe would use. Why a mouse trap? And look at where he's building it. Look at his workshop. The world behind him, that's not Nazareth. That's not first century AD Holy Land right there. It's as if Joseph exists in the world of the Engelbrechts and the screen makers. So what on earth could the mousetrap be? All these other things, all these other symbolic 
uh, meanings behind the lilies and the candles and the towels and the copper pots, all meaning, all referring to in the center, Mary's purity, Mary's worthiness as the mother of God. Joseph is working though. Joseph is part of it. He is protector. He is father on earth. And for us, for the Engelbrechts and the screen makers, he is the main metaphor of what is being made, the child, Jesus, Christ, the mousetrap, is the redemption, the, the uh, savior, the solution to the problem that is sin, the devil. Got it? The mousetrap is a late medieval, early Renaissance symbol of the triumph over evil. So the mouse is sin. The mousetrap, in this case, is Jesus. So here he is being made in the human sense, made in the metaphorical sense. Clear as mud. All of this again, dressed in those lovely oil paint glazes, layer after layer after layer. So we get the glow of angel wings, just as we get the lovely glow of sunlight coming through the windows. The lighting, I think, is the real uh, artistic triumph here. One last look. Zoomed in without the frame, so that might, might be a little skewed. So the door might not look quite right on the left there. We have left to right, the real world of the Engelbrechts and the screen makers, the donors, the scriptural, biblical world of the Annunciation with all of the trappings of being a worthy vessel, being a worthy young woman to be the mother of God. And the ultimate reason for that, to be a mousetrap, to be a problem solver, to be a solution to the problem of sin. And that's the key. An altarpiece like the Maroda altarpiece and like the Ghent altarpiece, they have these multiple panels because they're closed and opened up to display their lovely glowing figures on feast days, on Sundays, during mass. When they're placed in a church, they have a direct connection to the idea of communion. Remember that is when Jesus gives his body and his blood in the form of bread and wine. So the altarpiece here, in this case, this is Westminster Abbey, famous church in London, England is placed right above the altar table where the priest will conduct the sacrament of the Eucharist and transform, transfigure the bread into the body and the wine into the blood of Christ. This in the 15th century was not directly visible. This altar, this is the high altar it wouldn't have been visible to common worshipers, you know, people like you and me, perhaps. It would have been behind a screen. In fact, the priest would have been conducting that ritual with his back to us, saying it in Latin. And how many of you understand Latin? Not, it wasn't all that common among people like you and me back then either. So it would have sounded a little foreign. It would have been a little secret. It wouldn't have been uh, quite so out in the open the way that we have these great views in photography and online today. So here's a glimpse of Jan van Eyck's famous Ghent altarpiece closed. It is not a triptych, it's a polyptych, meaning many panels. So look, already closed, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten panels on the front. It's also monumental, freestanding, it could be placed at a high altar like we just saw. 
it also is big enough and bold enough to stand as a work of art on its own, even outside a cathedral or church. Again, we have donor portraits, husband and wife with their patron saints, underneath an Annunciation scene, overlooked by the great prophets of the Bible. Inside, we'll see Adam and Eve, the original sin in the Garden of Eden, the reason for Christ's coming. All of this is in the true Renaissance naturalism of body, making these bodies appear massive, three-dimensional, even on two-dimensional wood, to give a very real, a very palpable sense of the need of redemption because of original sin. If the priest is speaking in Latin, it's the visuals, right, that underscore the true message. If we can't understand the language, at least we can understand the painting. Open it up. We have Eve and Adam on either side, nude, covering themselves with fig leaves, and Eve even is holding a little apple there on the right-hand side. They act as bookends for a heavenly scene. Top center, that is God the Father, who in many ways is three in one. A little Christian theology again. The idea of the Trinity is that there's God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all manifestations of the one monotheistic Christian God. On his right, our left, is Mary, crowned as a, a worldly, heavenly queen. On the right, in his hair shirt underneath that green robe, is Saint John the Baptist. And see his scraggly beard? He was living out in the wilderness for, for quite some time. They're accompanied by a host of angels who look a lot like a 15th century choir that Jan van Eyck would be able to observe uh, in Ghent itself, playing at organs, playing uh, uh, cellos and other Renaissance instruments. All of this in beautiful uh, rendering of texture, every single jewel, every single thread almost, depicted again layer by layer by layer. The main event though is down below. So as you're looking at Jan van Eyck, go to Blackboard week two and click on the Closer to Van Eyck link because this shows each and every panel of the altarpiece zoomed in to the highest resolution available. And when you look at it close up, instead of just, you know, at arm's length all at once, it might make you think about it differently. You might uh, perceive, think about the story differently. You can even select uh, macro photography and infrared, essentially zooming in, but also x-raying the piece to see what changes and see those layers that Van Eyck painted in. So here we go. Oh, I already had it open. There we go. And there's a couple things you can do. Uh, the restored altarpiece, I go to the legacy website. This is where we have the great uh, access to the x-rays. They've been doing some restoring. Look at that color difference there. Uh, step one to step two. So let's open. Focus on adoration of the lamb because this is like Joseph's panel. This is the main event. Macro photography. We can zoom in, look at that individual blades of grass, beads and chains of the sensors that the angels swing. Give it a sense, give us some time to resolve here.
So now we can see we're at the level of brush stroke. We can see the lightest bits of highlight added by the artist. So let's zoom out just a little bit on the lamb here. It's called adoration of the lamb with the lamb centralized underneath a dove. And let's go to X-ray, you can see things that are quite original, things that have been changed, uh, figures that have been added and that have been changed or, or taken away. So layer by layer, he would have added the shapes, the very forms of the angels and the prophets and the lamb itself. Why the lamb? Notice where they are positioned too. We have a dove of the Holy Spirit in a beautiful corona of golden light centered directly below God the Father. So we have the Trinity, God the Father, Holy Spirit, who's left, the Son. The Son is the Lamb. Another way of thinking about Christ is the Lamb of God. And this Lamb in particular is standing on an altar. The Lamb is the sacrifice with a little stream of blood pouring into a chalice. For us, that might be a little, ooh, yeah? That is the theology here. And remember, this is an altarpiece. So down below on the altar table in the cathedral would be a chalice filled with wine and a, a Eucharist, the bread, the host, the body of Christ that the priest and the communal worshipers would then eat. So I don't know, have I scared you out of liking altar pieces? Maybe. All of this is based on the idea of oil paint creating a, a level of realism beyond what was once possible. Paint in any form is base plus pigment. So artists have been using up till now tempera, where the base is egg yolk or another protein like milk. Oil uses a natural oil base, typically linseed. The pigments are minerals, other solid substances. For instance, you could make lovely green paint out of spinach, ground into powder to make particular hues. So the effects of tempera versus oil, well, we've got Roger van der Weyden's portrait of a lady here. Let's add in an Italian work by uh, my me Memi here, Libo Memi, of the Virgin, the Madonna. Tempera on the left, oil on the right. Tempera tends to be this lovely velvety matte finish. Oil is glossier. So both of them can create light and shine as we can see on the left, but there's greater depth, you might say, in the richness of shadows, in the richness of uh, values in oil paint versus tempera. And one of the reasons why is oil paint doesn't dry as quickly as tempera. So you can add layer by layer, you can rework it, like we saw x-ray evidence of Van Eyck layering on uh, paint uh, layer by layer to the wood panel of the altarpiece. So van der Weyden, uh, Van Eyck, they're all using oil at maybe a slower pace, a more painstaking process here to give these surfaces more life, to give the three-dimensional figures more mass so that we believe uh, we are convinced of the naturalism. And that is also at play here in uh, Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife. This painting is also known as the Arnolfini wedding. And that could be one of the purposes of it. 
but there are a couple things that lend to maybe a, a deeper purpose uh, for this painting. So you could, at the very start, call it a portrait, and it's a portrait that definitely mixes the secular and the religious. For instance, this is an indoor scene of husband and wife, right? And their little dog, which is, you guessed it, a symbol, an icon of fidelity, loyalty. Because what do dogs do? They're man's best friend, right? They're loyal. And that comes from uh, age old ideas of dogs as symbols of loyalty. There's also on the finial of the bed, let me point this out here. St. Margaret, patron saint of childbirth and wives. And often the woman here is interpreted as pregnant, but look at this fold here, that U shape. She's lifting up her skirts and her skirts would be quite thick, especially the, the velvet outer skirt. So she's not necessarily pregnant. She just has a lot of clothes on. That too is because she stays indoors. She's very modest. She has her white veil. Giovanni Arnolfini, he's ready to go outside. He's got his fur lined coat. He's at the window there. He has his hat on and his shoes on. He's ready to go out into the outside world, the public versus the private. So we could draw. There we go. A center line again. That's very important for many of these Renaissance pieces. And some of the most important things are on that center line. Little Fido down there. Margaret just off to the right. The mirror, the chandelier with curiously one candle and writing on the wall. Those are very important. The mirror has 12 little roundels in its frame. 12 is an important number, 12 apostles. Right? Definitely 12 signs of the zodiac. So it's in a way a, a, an example of the universe. Uh, it is the planets in motion, as well as a reference to biblical figures. A mirror, too, can symbolize the literal eye of God. In this case, though, in the mirror, we have. Jan van Eyck's portrait. We have the back of Giovanni Arnolfini, the back of his wife, and teeny tiny in that concave mirror, convex, excuse me, is perhaps a portrait of the artist himself. And up above it says in Latin, essentially, Jan van Eyck was here. Jan van Eyck made this. Underneath that, or above that, I should say, the chandelier with the one candle, Think of the Trinity, three in one, of the presence of the divine. What type of thing would you need? Kind of a blessing, the presence of God, a witness for a marriage. That does seem to make sense, right? And other things like the shoes in the lower left, those all point to ideas of Fidelity, marriage, their traditional gifts of weddings, like the oranges in the background too. But it's not a typical wedding portrait, particularly since the artist has signed it himself. It could also be the record of a contract. Giovanni Arnolfini could be saying, look at his hand gestures. He is giving, he is conferring upon his wife the power to run his business in his absence, since he looks like he's about to leave. So each painting here is rather like a puzzle to be thought out as we consider the very religious aspects of life as well as secular, which to someone like Arnolfini and his wife would not be all that separate. Their religious life, their economic and political lives were intertwined. Everything from their local government to their marriage, to the way they lived hour by hour was in a way governed, ruled by, of 
theological, spiritual, Catholic ideals. In the next chapters, we're gonna look at the increasing secularization of this world. In a way, we're gonna look at a society letting go of some of those religious or more religious ideals for things called humanism, reason, and perspective is part of that study of the real world, a more scientific approach to art. In Dirk Boots's altarpiece here, I am zooming in, I'm just using the central panel here, The Last Supper. Again, composition is important. He's using a centralized composition. We can draw a line right down the center. And on that, you will see the convergence of each diagonal line of the tiles of the table itself. And that the vertical axis also happens to go right through the main guy, the main character, Jesus himself, seated at the table with his disciples. Yet this table is not something you'd find again in first century AD Jerusalem. This is a 1464 Flemish table in a Flemish interior with Flemish clothes. This is the Last Supper, the story of Easter essentially brought into the modern world. Linear perspective is used, but remember Dirk Boots is not necessarily wrong in his usage. He just has two competing goals, right? To make it convincingly naturalistic the scene, the bodies, the event, but also to make sure that the lines work to draw our focus and make us read the painting the proper way. So space here might be a little less convincing in terms of realism because you and I, if we're in the room, where are we standing? Are we on the floor? Are we floating up again like the Maroda altarpiece? A little, yeah. There's a skewing, there's a bending, you could say a stretching of perspective for a very particular iconographic use. So that we get the sense of the centralizing of Jesus. And there he is using not bread, but an actual wafer that you could recognize from the cathedral, from church on Sunday. Everything, the table's tilted down for us to see. And more importantly, when we go move on to Leonardo, everybody's seated around the table, the way it would be if we were walking in on a group of men, a guild, having dinner together. So there are nods to realism contextually, if not physically and visually. <laughs> 